Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you very much for our Bible study today. Thank you because of your love that keeps on teaching us and instructing us and warning us and encouraging us. I pray, Lord, that today your word will not fall to the ground, but it will fall to fertile ground of our hearts in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, that you help us to see what you are saying. Read aright. Interpret aright. Apply aright. And stand on this solid ground of your word so that when the winds of false doctrine perpetrated by false prophets and false teachers, when the winds are blowing, will stand firm on this unchanging word in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you grant us the grace that you granted the people that have gone before us as they stood firm to the end. Help us to stand firm to the end. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. In our study of the Bible, we are back to Second Peter, and we are in Second Peter chapter two. When we started Second Peter chapter two, I told you at that time that actually the whole chapter is warning the church, warning the people of God concerning false prophets and false teachers, and this is just Peter being used of God as a mouthpiece. To warn the people of God. Because in the last days, perilous times shall come. And then many false prophets will arise and deceive many. And many will follow their pernicious ways. That's the reason the Lord is warning us beforehand. So that we can be well prepared. But please understand. This is actually coming from Christ. Through Peter, the apostle of Christ or the servant of Christ. And if you look at it that way, this is the captain of our salvation, warning the soldiers in his army. This is the bridegroom that is warning his bride because of the impostors and because of the false prophets and because of the people that would like to lead the bride of Christ into evil, into loss, into spiritual adultery. And this is the head of the church, warning all the members of the church that as you are moving on in the journey of faith, and you are moving on to Canaan land, to the promised land, that there are trials in the way, there are difficulties in the way. And you want to understand that this is a Savior himself, because he shed his blood, because he gave himself, so that he can redeem us. And it's the Savior, the Redeemer, the Lord, warning the redeemed of the Lord, saying there will be false prophets and there will be false teachers, and therefore you should take note and take warning. I told you at that time that verse 1 of chapter 2 actually contains the kernel, the nudge, the very center, the nucleus of the whole chapter. And then verses 1 to 3 is an amplification. That is, it broadens it, explains it more that there will be false prophets, and he tells us the roles and the functions and the activities of those false prophets, and the people that are going to be influenced, and the people that are going to go astray as a result of the influence of the messages of those false prophets. And then the whole chapter is giving us a full explanation of what is contained in the nudge, in the kernel, in the nucleus, which you have in verse 1. And so then you want to understand that these apostles, like all the other apostles, they touch the word of God uncompromisingly, without fear, without favor, without fearing the false prophets of their time, and without seeking the favor of the rich followers of those false teachers, those faithful teachers of the word of God, the apostles of the early church. They counted nothing important except teaching the will of God. They never counted personal pleasure, personal pain, imprisonment even as anything. They never considered themselves. They focused on the obedience, on their obedience to the Lord and to the Savior, and they left the consequences in God's hand. And so should every preacher and every child of God 
speech today. And as we look at all these verses that we're reading, that we're studying, warning us against the influence and the backsliding, warning us against the power as well as the, the program of the false prophets, the false teachers. You want to understand that Peter was just yielding himself as a willing instrument in the hands of Almighty God to warn and to protect the church of the living God from false doctrines and deadly influence, the deadly influence of the false teachers. And actually, it wasn't peculiar to Paul and to Peter at all. Christ himself. What did he say in Matthew chapter 7 verse 15? Beware of false prophets. Which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly there are burning wolves. That is, these false prophets, they will come to you. They look so mild and so tender and so sheepish and so gentle and so meek, but inwardly there are burning wolves at they. What has Paul told us in Romans chapter 16, verse 17? He tells us, Mark them for the mark of Cain, mark them for the mark of Balaam. Mark them with the mark of the people that want to lead you astray. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, which you have learned, and avoid them. And even John. John the beloved, the apostle of love. You know, when you love people, you are going to warn them. When you love people and you see danger in front of them, you are going to warn them against the danger, the perdition, the deadly poison ahead of them. That's why you find that even John, the beloved, the apostle of love, he warned the people of God. What did he say? In 2 John verses 10 and 11, he said, If there come any unto you, even a relative that becomes a false prophet, any unto you, a husband that becomes a false prophet, a wife that becomes a false prophetess, a relative that becomes a false prophet, if there come any, Unto you. Anyone, a neighbor, anyone, somebody you have fellowship with before, somebody maybe even led you to the gospel, led you to the Lord. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. And Jude tells us, it says, For there are certain men crept in unawares. And then he describes their character, describes their lives. He says the ungodly men, they turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Denying the only Lord God. And our Lord Jesus Christ, he says these people, they speak evil of the things they know not. If they don't understand sanctification, they speak against it. If they don't understand one man, one wife, they speak against it. If they don't understand no divorce and remarriage, they speak against it. Anything they don't understand... They speak again, instead of going back to the world, searching the world, and seeing whether those pieces be so or not. Once they don't understand, they speak against it. And if they don't have victory in their lives, of course they speak against victory over sin. And it says these men are ungodly men. They speak evil of those things which they know not. And Jude ends up by saying woe unto them. These are the last days in which we are living. And the Bible already says that some shall depart from the faith. And it will give it to seduce his spirit. That's the reason why every faithful preacher, every faithful child of God will continue faithfully defending the word of God, the truth, and warning the people of God against error. I want you to look at Second Peter chapter 2, verse 13. All through to verse 19. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 13. And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in, in the daytime. Sports they are, and blemishes sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease, cannot stop from sin, beguiling, deceiving, leading astray on stable souls and hearts they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which are forsaking the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, son of Bozo, 
who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb are speaking with man's voice. For bad the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water. They are clouds that are carried with a, with a tempest. To whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they are low, they are tracked, they, they deceive. Through the laws of the flesh and through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error while they promise them liberty, while they promise them freedom, while they promise them deliverance, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought in bondage. As we look at these verses that we're looking at today, we uh, conveniently divide them into three parts. Number one, the carnality and the depravity of pleasure-loving false brethren. They still call themselves brothers and sisters, but they are false. The carnality and the depravity of pleasure-loving false brethren. Number two, the covetousness and deception of false prophets like Balaam. If you look at false prophets anytime, uh, you will see the similarity between them and Balaam. And even today as you look at false prophets and false teachers, and you look at the life of Balaam, you will see a lot of similarities between those false teachers of today and Balaam. The covetousness and the deception of false prophets like Balaam. Point number three, the corruption and deterioration going from bad to worse. Going from just rejected, they become rotting, worthless. And it appears they become almost irredeemable. The corruption and the deterioration of false teachers and backsliders. Point number one. The carnality and the depravity of pleasure-loving false brethren. Look at verses 13 and 14 of Second Peter chapter 2 and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness. That's just telling us that God is not just going to keep on looking and allow a man or a woman and allow a, a covetous fellow that is just starting this or starting that and God knows that in what motive is just to make money out of people or because of the pride in the heart of man. God is not going to allow such an individual to just be deceiving people. And then leading them from the way of heaven, the way of holiness, to the way of perdition and eternal punishment. And God will just leave them like that. That's the reason it says in verse 13, they will receive, they shall receive the reward of unrighteousness. And then it says, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime, they count it pleasure, they find pleasure. In disobeying God. They, can, they have pleasure in rioting. They have pleasure in doing that which is evil. And then it says that in that same verse, there are spots and blemishes. That is, when they even come among us, it's like the white lily. They become a spot, a stain on that white lily. They become a stain on the white garment, on the white robe of righteousness. And they don't only remain unrighteous, and they don't only remain evil, they influence other people to backslide, to go away from the Lord, and to become a spot, a stain, a blemish in the white garment of the bridegroom, of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says they are spots, and they are blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings. That is, that the spot here, that is a spot with an R. That's like a game. They count deception as a game. And they count uh, the gifts of the Spirit as a game. And they just, they just do whatever they want. And the innocent people, the ignorant people, they know nothing, they don't understand. And it is, it is like they just play games with the souls of men and the souls of the women. And then it says that their own deceivings, while they feast with you, they even, you know, some of them are even free. They come in and they come out. They say, well, that, that I've left, you know, the fellowship here doesn't mean that I'm not part of you anymore. They are bold. And with their bold face, they come in our midst. They may dress the way they want. They may know that they are very different, even externally, even outwardly, but they are bold. And even the language of their mouth, 
And the smell coming out, the odor coming out of their body, they, they are bold. You might have had stories about them. It might have been of adultery, or fornication, of illegitimate children, whatever. Whatever stories you have had. I'm telling you that these backsliders, false brethren, they are bold. They come in and they come out among us. And if you ask them any question, you say, uh, my uh, so-and-so, uh, did I hear that? What did you hear? What did you hear that you have not heard before? What have I done that, you know, that was not done before? What have I done that David did not do? What did I do that Peter did not do? What did I do? That, what did you hear? Get out of my way. God is a loving God. All you holy, holy people that are condemning people, what do you mean? You can't even correct them. You can't help them. And you can't make them to kneel down and pray and seek the face of the Lord. They are bold in evil. And they feast themselves among the people of God. In verse 14, having eyes full of adultery. Having eyes full of adultery. That is, their eyes, if you are not careful, will catch you. And make you to commit adultery. If they are men, you know, have you found these men that they will tell you, they say, I don't know, I don't understand. Women are just attracted to me anywhere I go. And it doesn't matter whether I'm dressing fully or I just wear short sleeve or whatever it is. Women are always attracted to me. I mean, eyes full of adultery. And if they're women, of course, they say, well, God must have put this talent, special mystery in my life. That it doesn't matter any society I find myself, and it doesn't matter <clears throat> whether those people are apostles or prophets, anointed servants of God. Anywhere I go as a lady, it doesn't matter about many children, but when I appear there and I look at them like this, they leave every other thing they are doing and they concentrate on me. That's my log. That's your perdition. That's your sin. That's your eternal judgment. That's something the devil has put inside your life to drag you irresistibly into hellfire. Having eyes full of adultery and cannot cease from sin. They won't even make an attempt to resist sin or to go away from sin. And then it says they are beguiling, deceiving, cajoling, unstable souls, ignorant souls, Souls that are not steadfast in the things of the Lord, deceiving them, beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, caused children. You see what the Bible is telling us there, and this is giving us real warning. It's telling us that many who follow the pernicious ways of the false teachers, eventually they abandon themselves into shameful practices and acts of the flesh. They lose all sense of shame. And they seem not to feel any guilt, though they are, they are a scandal or a disgrace to the Christian profession and to the church. They indulge in the most degrading, corrupt passion, having seared their consciences and hardened their hearts. They have so deceived themselves that they call good evil and they call evil good. They have trained themselves that the thing that is good, they call it evil. And the thing that is evil, they call it good. They've repeated it to themselves so many times. Good is evil. Good is evil. Evil is good. Evil is good. They've repeated it to themselves so many times, they come to believe it. In Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5, reading there from verse 18. It says, Woe to them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin as sit while with a catro. And then in verse, in verse 20, it says, One to them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitterness for sweet and sweet for bitter. You see, these people, although they think they are doing it, everybody knows it to be evil. And everybody will be saying, My friend, why are you doing this? My friend, why are you doing this? They say, What am I doing? It looks good to them. Because they have brainwashed themselves, and they have told themselves so many times, and they have silenced their own conscience, and they have deadened their own conscience, and they have hardened their own hearts to the point they believe that the evil they are doing is actually for the good of the kingdom of God. And these are the people that believe what they say. It's a lie. 
and it's deception, but they'll say it convincingly. And that's why we're told in 2 Thessalonians, look at your Bible. 2 Thessalonians, reading there, chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. It says, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, not ordinary delusion, strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. They will believe even a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And to these depraved false brethren, the feasts of charity becomes to them occasion for gluttony. When we say feasts of charity, look at your Bible. Jude, Jude, verses 12 and 13, very similar to the verses we read in Second Peter. These are spots in your feasts of charity. Feasts of charity. What does that mean? Oh, you remember? Whenever we're having wedding, and we're having the wedding reception, you'll find some of these backsliders. They won't come to church again here, and they won't come to the Bible study here. They have separated themselves from us. The holiness message is too much for them. And then they will come. If they, it's like they, they, they have informants that inform them whenever we are having wedding in the group of districts. And then you will see these people. And if they are women, they will go everywhere, bold-faced. And they will, didn't you see me? Why didn't you greet me? You only greet deeper life people. Because I've left deeper life, so I am not your sister now. Why are you looking at me as if, uh, you know, I am not a child? I am going to get to that heaven before you. You hear? Bold. Before you are able to say anything, they shock you with their words. And then they will go another place, and then they will go to the people that are getting Ah, I just heard. You didn't give me your car. You didn't send your car to me. You listen to your deeper life people. Me, I am deeper than some of you that say you are deeper life. My heart is sincere. If you see anything in my ear, that is, I'm sincere. You people, you don't wear it in your ear. You are hypocrites because of pastor. You don't want him to see you. Me, I'm very, I'm, I'm clear. I'm a child of God. I have my quiet time, very wonderful time with the Lord. In fact, if I tell you, the revelation I've been receiving, I'm out of bondage. I am free. Whenever I pray, the channel, two-way channel, express road, between me and Almighty God. Since I left you people in bondage, I became very, very free. And they go about and go about and go about in our feast of charity. <laughs> the only one they will not come is our Lord's Supper. But they will come to wedding, they will come to funeral ceremony, and they will be bragging and boasting about. You see, that's what we... But we need to understand, don't be fooled by their boldness and by the things they say. I'm still in Jude verses 12 and 13. These are spots in your fields of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water. Carried about of winds and trees whose fruits withereth without fruit. Twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea. Forming out their own shame. Forming out their own shame. Wandering stars. They won't stay in one church after they leave here. They leave here. They go to another place. After three months, as of them again, they've gone to another place. After one year, as of them again, they've gone to another place. Wandering stars. The grace to be stable. And the grace to be steady. They always find something, no matter which church they go, something they don't agree with. And once they don't agree with something, and the people there, and they have been going along with them and petting them, wanting them to say, give me them position, one day something will happen. As they are not able to stay here, because of the word of holiness, they will not be able to stay wherever they go to. They will be wandering stars. It says wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness, Forever. And that's the reason the Lord is warning us and is saying, all these pleasure-loving false brethren, you don't get involved with them because they'll pull you back into sin. Uh, James chapter 5, reading verses 5 and 6. James 5, 5 and 6. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth, and being wanton, ye have nourished your heart as in a day of slaughter. The ye have condemned and killed the just, and it does not resist you. In First Timothy chapter 5, verse 6. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 6. It says, but she, 
It's a woman. She, a professing Christian woman. She, a so-called sister. She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. You see, this is the characteristic of the false prophets and the false prophetesses and, and the false believers, the false brothers and the false sisters. They live in pleasure. And it says they are dead while they live. And then in Numbers, Numbers chapter 11. Numbers 11 reading from verse 4. And the, the problem sometimes with in a church is that even though there is not all these false brethren that have left, some of the false brethren may still be here. And you will discover that they are just part of the mixed multitude. If any murmuring is going to start, it starts from them. If any gossiping is going to brood out, it starts from them. And if any conflict is going to come up in the church, it starts from them. And if any disagreement with sound doctrine is going to start, it starts with them. And if there is any riot that is going to start, it starts from them. If there is any disobedience rebellion that is going to begin in the church, it starts with them. Mixed multitude. In Numbers chapter 11, reading from verse 4, and the mixed multitude that was among them fell and lost him. And the children of Israel also wept again. It started from the mixed multitude, or from the wishy-washy, unstable uh, people that were in the midst of the people of God. The people that the manna coming from heaven will never satisfy them. Our kind of music will never satisfy them. And the preaching of the word will never satisfy them. And the prayers we pray will never satisfy them. No matter the miracles that are happening, no matter the manna we're receiving from heaven every day, it will never satisfy them. They must complain. They must complain. And it starts from the mixed multitude. You know, before mixed multitude came, who oh, got this manna from heaven, and we came to have a Bible study. We just enjoyed the Lord, and we just enjoyed the teaching of the Word of God. We're gathered in this place to worship you, to worship your Christ Jesus. So forget about yourself and concentrate on Him and worship Him, Christ Jesus the Lord. Unto Him shall the gathering of the people be. We sang, we preached, nobody complained. But as the mixed multitude came, half baked Christians, the people that are not fully converted, that are not yielded to God, that are not centered and focused on the word of God and the will of God alone, they began to murmur, they began to murmur. And then the murmuring spread to the real, genuine people of God in verse 4. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell and lost him. And the children of Israel also went and uh, wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish and which we did eat in Egypt freely. And the cucumbers and the melon and the, and the, and the leeks and the, and the onions and the garlic. They didn't remember the lashes of the servants of Pharaoh. What they remember is what they ate in Egypt. And you know these people, they don't, they don't remember the good things the Lord has done for us here. The salvation, the change of life, the way he turned us around, and the way he corrected our lives and shaped us up. They don't remember that. The miracles of childbearing, they don't remember that. The people that have been barren for how many years? 12 years, 17 years, 21 years that God gave children, they don't remember and the mental people, the deranged people, and those who are totally, totally psychologically off the line that God delivered was the word of knowledge and the power of faith. They don't remember. And the people that they were here, when they came here, they had nothing. Now God, God has blessed them, and God has blessed their families. They don't remember. And the people that should have gone to prison, but the Lord delivered them, shaped up their lives, and now they are living straight. They don't remember. And the people, the village people that were doing juju against them. And then we prayed here and God delivered them. And those village people, they came to confess and bowed before them and surrendered. They don't remember. All they remember is, uh, you know, all these other churches, they enjoy themselves. There's no discipline. Everything is going on fine in our church here. Bible, Bible, every time. Look at this, look at this. They don't remember the good things. The people that church gave money to rent accommodation, they don't remember. 
And the people that when their women delivered, their wives delivered, they had nothing. It was the church, it was the brethren that helped them so that things are okay. They don't remember. All they remember is the onion we ate in Egypt and the garlic we ate in Egypt. They don't remember the lashes and the nightmares and the bad dreams and the evil things that they got in Egypt. Mixed multitude. That's why the Lord is warning us that this church, God will clean up the church. Yeah. And all the mixed multitude, we're not saying God will drive them away. We're praying that God will touch their lives. It will transform their lives. So that all this murmuring and grumbling and lack of love and lack of unity and lack of freedom with one another. So that everything will pass away. And then we will, the, the, the liberty we had in the past and the joy of the Lord we had in the past and the freedom we had in the past and the love and no suspicion. No suspicion. When you came to this deeper life, my brother, my sister, did you know somebody who was a witch? Did you know anybody that was a wizard? Didn't you just shake hands with everybody and just love everybody who knew which at that time if you saw anybody in the dream that was trying to play some funny game you give them john 3 16 for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life who feared any witch who feared any wizard before these mixed multitudes came in that's why i'm telling you let's go back to where we began where you fear no witch and you fear no wizard. Where you walk free, and you preach free, and you pray free, and you sing free, and there's nobody that can torment your life because there's a wall of fire around you. Where the word of authority is in your mouth, and there's nobody that will be chasing you around and you're running about because, you know, somebody is trying to kill you. Who is trying to, who can kill you before your time? It's because of the things we're hearing from all these false prophets around. I pray God will transform the lives of the mixed multitude. So, in the, then we read in second, in second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter three. I'm reading from verse thirteen. These uh, backsliders and false prophets, you know, these people that have gone, uh, they're going from bad to worse. A few times I see a few of them. And, you know, if you saw them three years ago, they were bad. But when you see them after three years again, they are worse than what they were before. Because, you see, backsliding will be going on and on and on. In Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Deceiving and being deceived. In Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, that which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, and to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children, her converts, and the people she has deceived, and they are following her. I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he, which searches the reins and the heart, and I will give unto every one of you according to your words. We go to point number two. The covetousness and the deception of false prophets like Balaam. The covetousness and the deception of false prophets like Balaam. As uh, I told you earlier, when you look at the lives, at the functions, at the roles, at the ministries, at, at everything surrounding false prophets and false teachers today, you will see similarities between Balaam and all these false prophets and false teachers. In Second Peter chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, which have forsaken the right way. Before you can forsake something, you must have been in that thing before. That means they were in the right way before. But these false prophets and these false brethren and these backsliders are forsaken the right way. And they are gone astray. They don't know they have gone astray. They tell us they are still alright. They tell us everything is still okay. They tell us they're still going to heaven, but the Holy Ghost is saying, and the scripture is saying, that they have gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozo, 
who loved the wages of unrighteousness and was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb are speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of that prophet of the prophet. What, what, are we, what are we saying about this Balaam? Well, of course, I've told you that these false prophets and the false teachers and their followers are likened to Balaam. Number one, Balaam was in the right way before he forsook the right way. Number two, Balaam was a true prophet of God before he went into error and he became a soothsayer. He was a good prophet, a true prophet of God before. Number three, we know that this fellow, he knew God. Balaam, Balaam knew God. If you read the story of Balaam, you will know that number three, he knew God. Number four, he had the power of God in his life. Even people recognized it, and the Moabites recognized it, and Balak, the king of the Moabites, said, we know that whosoever you bless is blessed, whosoever you curse is cursed. He had the power of God. Number five, he sought the will of God. Whatever he wanted to do, he saw the will of God. That's why when those people came from Balak and they wanted to employ him to cause the children of Israel, he said, wait a minute, just wait there. I need to ask God because that's my practice. As a true prophet of God, I always ask God what he wants me to do. Number six, God revealed his will to him. Balaam, these people that are here, what have they come to do? Oh, they have come to Balak and sent them that I will go and cause these people of Israel. And God revealed his will to him and said, You will not go with them because they are blessed. Number seven, at the first, was if he was faithful to reject the offer of the enemy of God's people. And he faithfully reported a God's refusal to let him go or the princes of Balak. He told them, God has refused me to go. I cannot go. He uttered some great, great prophecies. This true prophet. He uttered some great, great prophecies from God. And look at this. In Numbers chapter 23. Numbers chapter 23. And begin to see the, the great, the great uh, revelations and prophecies that he uttered. And you will know that he knew God at a particular time before he went astray. In Numbers chapter 23, verse 9. 23, verse 9. For from the top of the rocks I see him. And from the hills I behold him. And lo, the people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. That is, no nation will assimilate the people of Israel. They will stay as a sovereign nation by themselves. And they're still staying today in verse 10. Who can count the dust of Jacob? And the number of the fourth part of Israel. Let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like his. He said, God will so multiply them that it will be impossible to even count the number of the children of Israel. That wasn't that a great prophecy coming from him. Verse 23, surely there is no enchantment against Jacob. Neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time, it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel what God has wrought. He prophesied concerning these people. And he said, there is no enchantment. There is no good. There is no juju against these people of God. In verse 24, he says, behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a young lion. And he shall not lie down till he eat the, of the prey and drink of the blood of the slain. He's talking about the victory that the children of Israel will have. You will see then that this man, he was a true prophet before he backslid and before he went astray. In chapter 24, verse 2, it says, And Balaam lifted up his eyes, and he saw Israel abiding in his tent, according to the tribe, and the Spirit of God came upon him. He knew the Lord before, and then in verse 5, we're told, How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacle, O Israel. As the valleys are they spread forth, as the gardens by the riverside, as the trees of lying aloes, which the Lord has planted, and the cedar trees beside the waters. He said, it is the Lord himself that had planted the people of Israel. He didn't know them. He didn't know them in the natural, but the Lord revealed that to him. And then he tells us in verse 7, he shall pour water out, he shall pour the water out of his pockets, and his sea shall be in many waters and his king shall be higher than Agag. See, at this time Israel had no king. 
But then this man prophesied that a time will come when Israel will have a king and the king of Israel will be higher than Agag and the kingdom shall be exalted. And then it says God brought him forth out of Egypt. He has a seed were the strength of an unicorn. He shall eat up the nations his enemies and shall break their bones and pierce them through with his arrows. He couched, he lay down as a lion and as a great lion. He sh who shall stir him up? Blessed is he that blessed thee and cursed is he that cursed thee. Hear Balaam. Hear what he's saying. You know that this man, he had the spirit of God. But before he backslid and went astray. And then in verse 16 it says, He has said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance and having his eyes open. He's talking about himself. His eyes were open, and yet he saw the vision of the Almighty God. Then he now began to talk about Jesus Christ, about the Messiah, about the Redeemer that is to come in verse 17. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not near. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Seth. And then he says, in verse 18, and Edom shall be, shall be a possession. Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies. Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion. And shall destroy him that remaineth in the city. And when he looked on Amalek, he took up his parable. And he said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be that he perish forever. You see, this Balaam, he had the spirit of God before, but then eventually because of the wages of unrighteousness. In order to receive the money uh, promised by Balak, when eventually he couldn't cause the people of Israel, you know what he did? He did something. Uh, look at it. Jesus even mentioned it. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. I'm reading to you there from verse 14. Revelation chapter 2. Look at what Balaam eventually did. Verse 14, chapter 2, verse 14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast his tumbling block before the children of Israel, and to eat things, sacrifice to idols, and to commit fornication. Eventually, when Balaam saw that the children of Israel could not be defeated, and that Balak could not be able to conquer them, he knew, as somebody who knew God, that God hates sin. That the only way you'll be able to defeat the children of Israel is if they commit sin. And so Balaam called Balak and he said, ah, the money you wanted to give me, don't put it in your pocket, I still want it. Uh, but you didn't do the job I called you to do. I said that these people should be defeated and you are just blessing them and they're going stronger. And so, ah, don't, don't vex, I know what to do. You see, their God doesn't like immorality, fornication, and adultery. And you have all these beautiful women in Moab. If you can send your women to their meals to entice them, and then they meet with them and do evil with them and commit sin, God will forsake them. You will defeat them. And when you defeat them, remember, I taught you the strategy and the method, my money you will give me. And Balak said, if it works, I'll give you your money. Because of the wages of unrighteousness. Are there not people like that? That here we are, children of God, people of God, church of God, were secured. And nobody can touch us. You know how strong we were? That even our children, our little children, if they were going on the way, and any kidnapper kidnapped them, when they take them to where they are taking them to, and then they want to do their sacrifices and everything, they might see light, or they might see an angel of God, or they might see something, and then they will say, Ah, little girl, where are you coming from? Who are your parents? Are you a Christian? We we'll say, Yes, I'm a Christian. Which church do you go? I go to deeper life. Eh? You people, how did you bring deeper life for a girl here? Go out, go out, go out. They'll give her her address and then she will be on the side of the road and angel will come and say, little girl, enter this vehicle and then get her to the house and point the house and say, that is your house. Did you hear that before? Yes. Do you hear that today? Because Balaam's came into our midst 
and so that the power in the church is holiness and purity and the unity and the law. And then, little by little, these Balaams, they began, they knew, they knew, they knew that if there can be division and discord and disagreement and fighting among us, the power, the protection will leave, will become just ordinary like any other church. So these Balaams, they began to say, if you want to catch this deeper life as a whole church, you cannot catch them ordinarily. Witches cannot catch them. Kidnappers cannot catch them. Four one night cannot catch them. They are too holy. Holy, holy people. Ah, uh -uh, I don't need money. If they find money on the ground, they will go and take it to the person it belongs to. If you want to catch them, here is the way to catch them. And these Balaams have counseled quite a lot of people just to weaken and to destroy the church of the living God. God will make us strong. I said, God will make us strong. Now, so Balaam, he advised this uh, Balak. And eventually, when the war broke out, do you know Balaam even joined the Moabites in fighting the war? Somebody who was on God's side, somebody who was prophesying great things, good things, concerning the people of Israel, he joined them and battled against Israel. Look at your Bible in, uh, in uh, Numbers chapter 31. Numbers chapter 31. Let me read verse 15, verse 16 to you first. Numbers 31, verse 15, verse 16. And Moses said unto them, Have you saved all the women alive? Behold, these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel, the advice of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Let me show you the story. It was, you've seen it there, verse 16. It was Balaam that advised Balak to make the children of Israel commit immorality with the Moabites. And because of that, the judgment of God came upon them. Look at the story in, in chapter 25, chapter 25 of Numbers. And from verse 1, And the Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit wardom, that's fornication, adultery, with the, with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, of their idols. And the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. When Jezebel catch some men, they can bow down to idols. They can do anything. When the Moabites, these women of the world, when they catch some men and they attract them with their eyelids, and we are so called beauty, which is ugliness in the sight of God. When they catch these men, they can do anything. Look at the children of Israel that Balak could not overcome. When Balaam advised Balak and said, Send your women to them, and he did. Then these children of Israel, they committed morality with them, and they began to worship their idols, and Israel joined himself in Basile to Baal And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, and that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto the people. Jump down to verse 9. And those that died, and those that died. Remember they died in sin? Remember they died in adultery? Remember they died worshipping idols? Those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. Because of the advice of Balaam, to Balak, 24,000 went into hellfire. But look at this now. I told you that Balaam even joined them in fighting the war, fighting against the people of God. Before I read the verse to you, would you be surprised? Those Balaams, who were true prophets of God, who were true children of God, Balaams, who were here with us, a brother or a sister, who loved us, who agreed with us, who joined hands with us, Balaams, who taught the same holiness, the same sanctification with us, Balaam, that will defend this church and defend the pastor to the point of almost fighting before after they backslid and they went away from the Lord, these Balaams, they go to join, they don't care, they can join, allow me, even Muslims, to fight against 
the church they defended before. Balaam. Balaams that were with us before, loved us, we went in, we went out, we ate together, we did publicity together, we did retreat together, we did everything together. Balaam can now join the enemies of righteousness and fight against us and give them technique and give them tips and give them ideas how they can fight us and what can weaken us. I'm telling you, we're living in a world where those of us who are standing, I pray you will keep on standing. Yeah. Imagine yourself, my brother. Imagine yourself, my sister. You love us. Here you are today. See, how I just made an announcement yesterday, and I encourage you to come to the Bible study. See, I didn't spend up to 10 minutes. See how you are here today because of your love for God. Think about yourself as a Balaam, backsliding. I pray you'll never backslide. Yeah. And then joining the enemies of righteousness and joining our enemies and fighting against us and becoming a soldier in the army of the enemies of God. I pray it will never happen to you. Yeah. Look at it now. Numbers chapter 31 verse 8. And they slew, you know, they were, look at verse 7. And they warred, they warred against the Midianites. As the Lord commanded Moses, and they slew all the males, verse 8, and they slew the kings of Midian, beside the rest of them that were slain, namely Evi, Rechem, and Zor, and Or, and Reba, five kings of Midian, and Balaam also. The son of Baal, they slew with the sword. He joined them in the army. I pray you will never join our enemies. Hey, you have been our friend, you've been a worker here, you've been a beloved brother, a beloved sister here. Even if you made a mistake, even if you did something and we disciplined you. Is that discipline so, so strong? To plant enmity in your heart and to go and join the enemies of the people of God and be fighting against us? Come back. Because, you know, that's not of God. We sang together. We prayed together. We said we were going to heaven together. And we're still on our journey. And we still want to get to heaven. Why are you leaving us? And then you go to join our enemies. Look up here. You can't fight me. I'm the one God used to bring you to the knowledge of the truth. How can you go and join? The, you know the people, since we started... Jesus had enemies, Paul had enemies, and the church had enemies, and we have enemies, but we're praying for them. How can you? How can you? With all that God has done in your life, with all the messages you have received, with the fellowship we have together, with the Bible I read to you, and with the watch I taught you, with the sanctification I laid down for you, how can you? With the prayers I prayed for you, how you got married, how you got children, how you are healed, how you are delivered. How can you go and join the enemies of the people of God and fight against your brother here, the lover of your soul, and the one that is caring for you? You cannot do it. If you've been doing it, repent and God will forgive you. I come to point number three. Point number three is the corruption and the deterioration of the false teachers and the backsliders. The, the corruption and the deterioration of the false teachers and the backsliders. We're in 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter. I'm reading chapter 2, verses 17, 18, and 19. These are wells without water and clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. It says, for, for when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they are low, they deceive, they entice. Through the loss of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome of the same, is he brought in bondage. Here the, the, the Lord is telling us about the corruption deterioration of the false teachers, the false prophets, and the followers of the pernicious ways of the backsliders. Both Peter and Jude employ strong, strong words to convey the emptiness of the boasting of the promises of the false teachers. Look at Jude verses 12 and 13 again. These are spots in your feasts of charity 
when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds without without water, carried about well, about of winds, trees whose fruit wither it, whose uh, without fruit twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, forming out their shame, their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And look at ten characteristics about these people. Number one, they are wells without water. When somebody is traveling in the desert, in the hot desert, and he sees a mirror, something looking like water in front, or something like a whale, he's eager, he's happy, he's joyful, because he's, he's weary, and he's thirsty. And he sees this well in the desert, and he gets there, and it's well without water. What disappointment. And clouds carried about with a tempest. Clouds just being carried about with a tempest, unstable. Just like clouds, not having freedom of himself, of herself. Just being driven about by every winch of doctrine. Number three, it says clouds without water, clouds without rain. As you see the cloud, oh, you say, ah, thank God. It appears that, you know, the ground that is dusty and the ground that is dry and the ground that is unproductive and fruitless. Now everything is going to be refreshed because look at the clouds. What well, rain is going to come? Eventually there is no rain. Disappointment. That's the situation of these false prophets because they are like clouds without rain. Number four, trees whose fruit withereth. Their fruits wither. Now, you understand what he's talking about? He's talking about false prophets. And these false prophets, they, they have ministry, ministry. They run here, they run there, they do everything. And then eventually, as they're looking for fruit of that ministry, everything withers. Because, you see, the kind of people they deceive and they are bringing together, those are unstable people. They don't stay. And it's a waste of time, it's a waste of life, it's a waste of skill, it's a waste of ability that those false prophets will labor and labor and labor and their trees without fruit because their fruits wither. And it says trees without fruit twice dead. That is, they try to gather something up, the thing dies, then it dies first and then they bring it up again, it dies again and there's no hope again, twice dead. And then it says, number, uh, number six, trees without root, that they themselves, they don't have any root. Because he that heareth these things of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto, unto a tree, unto a house, that is planted, that is built upon the sun. And then the waves will come, and then the winds will blow, and the rain will come, and the flood will beat upon that house, and it falls, and it is irrepairable. Because... It doesn't have any root, any foundation. Number seven, they are raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Foaming out their own shame. When you hear them talk, and the things they say, you'll be wondering, doesn't, doesn't this person know that this is shameful for him to even be saying that? And then in number eight, it says wandering stars. Just roaming about, just roaming about. Wandering stars. Although they might think it's a good thing, they say, you know, uh, it's like, I need to taste. I've, I've been in different life for such a long time. And they just, you know, put us in a cage and we never knew what is going on in another place. So now I'm at liberty to move about and to wander about. And so they go here and then they say, I've tasted that. Now then they go here, they say, I've tasted that. Now then they go here, they have tasted that wandering stars. And then it says, they are speakers of swelling words of vanity. And then they are servants of corruption. And that's the reason the Lord is teaching us all this, so that by the grace of God, none of us will be like this in Jesus' name. Amen. These are the people that put on the appearance of virtue, but they are destitute of real godliness. They promise life and liberty, and their followers experience spiritual destitution and eternal death eventually, while they themselves are the servants of corruption. Uh, look at uh, what he's saying, and this, the reason you should avoid it by all means. See, in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. Ephesians 4 verse 14 that ye henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Don't be like that. That by the slight of men, by the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Third John 
for John verses 9, 10, and 11. Uh, it's describing these kind of people that resist the truth. For John from verse 9. It says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, preaching against us with malicious words. Can you imagine that? John the Beloved, a true servant of God, a true minister of the gospel, and a beloved minister that the Lord Jesus Christ appointed. He came to that church to declare the mind of God, the word of God. And this Diotrephes was bold enough, audacious enough, to speak against and pray against us with malicious words. Not content, therewith neither does he himself receive the brethren, and he forbiddeth them that, that would, and casteth them out of the church. He took loss into his son. And if anybody will obey the word of God, he will torture and torment and, and excommunicate that individual. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God. He that doeth evil has not seen God. Titus chapter 1. In Titus chapter 1, reading from verse 10 to verse 16. It says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped. All these people that are preaching false doctrine, by the grace of God, over here will stop their mouth. Amen. Whose mouths must be stopped. Why? Because they subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not fulfill the Lucas sake because of money. In verse 13, this is a true witness. Wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Then in verse 16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work, reprobate. Well, you say, what's, uh, what's awaiting them? Second Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, the first part of verse 13, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness. And then in verse 17, the latter part of verse 17, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. That word mist there means a thick gloom. To whom a thick gloom of darkness is reserved forever. This refers to the place of future punishment, a place of intense darkness and suffering, awaiting the teachers of false doctrine, who lead ignorant souls to error and perdition. That means hellfire, a place of torment, is prepared for the devil and his angels, and all who forsake God to please self and Satan will spend eternity in that same place of torment. Please remember, it's not only because of the sin they commit personally, but because of leading other people astray. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 41 and verse 42. Matthew chapter 13, verse 41. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them that do iniquity. The people that offend, that means they offend people, they offend the people of God and lead them astray. They cause them to offend. And then they also do iniquity. Well, those people be cast out of the kingdom of God. And it says, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Today the Lord has warned us that we shall beware of false prophets. And it's calling us, number one, so we ourselves will not be backsliders, will not be false prophets, will not be false teachers, and will not have anything to do with well, the false teachers and the false prophets, will not support them, and we will not promote them, and we will not encourage anybody to attend their meetings, will not listen to their cases, will not read their literature, will not listen to anything that is coming from all those false prophets, will keep ourselves pure. I pray that on the final day, when the Lord will come, and the saints will go marching in, you will not be missing in Jesus' name. Amen. I've told you everything I told you because I love your soul. Don't reject the word of God because you are in league with antichrists, or because you are in love with the people that are opposing the righteous standard of the word of God. Come to the side of the Lord and say, Yes, Lord, 
whatever it is and whoever it is that is doing evil, I forsake them, I join in with the people of God, I will not be a Balaam. You will not be a Balaam in Jesus' name. Why don't you rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. I will not be a Balaam. I will not join the evil people. I will not join ranks. For the unbelievers, for the false prophets, for the false teachers, come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord Almighty. Then I will receive you and be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Come to the Lord's side. Come to the Lord's side. The word of God is very clear. The word of God is very plain. Make up your mind before you go. You'll follow the Lord and serve him. Lord, I will. Lord, I will. I will love your chosen people. Lord, I will. Lord, I will. Lord, I will. Lord, I will. I will follow you and serve you till the end. I've made up my mind to serve you, Lord. Lord, I will. Lord, I will. Make up your mind. Make up your mind. Make up your mind. Make up your mind. Don't let anybody deceive you. Make up your mind to stand for the truth and stand with the people of God. 